Hey everyone, welcome to this tutorial video where I'm going to be walking you through the steps of getting a new computer set up for the very first time. And yes, you could also use this if you are repurposing an old computer. I'm going to be setting up this computer that I just recently built. It's my June build of the month and all the parts inside would cost you around $900. This video is going to be broken up into four parts. So the first part is going to be doing system setup in the UEFI before you install Windows. Second step is going to be installing Windows 10. The third step is going to be doing driver updates and setting up Windows 10 with software. And then the fourth step is going to be getting gaming stuff set up. So I'll be installing Steam and I'll also be installing OBS to do a quick gaming and streaming configuration. Excellent! The Mod Mic series by Antlion features three broadcast quality mics, which can be attached to headphones or a VR visor to create the ultimate headset. The Mod Mic Uni's analog 3.5mm connection works with nearly any device, including Xbox and PlayStation controllers. The Mod Mic USB is USB powered with superior sound quality in both omni and unidirectional settings, and the flagship Mod Mic Wireless features noise cancelling and high quality recording modes, and is the only mic in the world that delivers a full 16 bit 48kHz audio signal via aptX low latency encoding. Click the sponsor link in the description for more. So let's begin with the tools you will need for this job and you're of course going to need the computer that you just built uh, as well as a power cord for it which should have come with your power supply. You will need another computer. I'm representing that with my laptop here, but I'm also going to be assuming that maybe you're upgrading from an older gaming system. So when we're using this other computer to do setup stuff, I will point that out and I'll also be simulating transferring some games that you might have already downloaded off of this system onto the new one. You will need some external storage. You'll need a USB drive that's four gigabytes or bigger. It's going to need to be formatted as FAT32, but you probably don't need to worry about that because the installer will automatically format it for you. And then especially if you're upgrading from an old system and you want to transfer stuff Stuff over or get stuff backed up. It helps to have an external storage drive. Uh, I'm using this Asus ROG Arian because it's an external M.2 NVMe drive, so it's very fast. But you could use any larger size USB drive or an external 2.5 inch drive, for example. It probably goes without saying, but just to be thorough, you will need a monitor for your computer and you will also need peripherals like a mouse and a keyboard. And then of course you will need internet access, which I'm assuming you have since you're watching this video, but I'm representing it by my ethernet cable over here, which is connected to my local network switch on the wall. You can also get by with Wi-Fi if the motherboard you used has it pre-installed. This motherboard does not, so I'm going to be relying on our wired connection. So we're going to do system setup with the new system, and the first part of that is going to be updating the BIOS or UEFI, which is the software setup environment that's built into the motherboard. Then we're going to enable the XMP settings for the memory, and that makes sure the memory is running at its rated speed rather than its default speed, which is usually slower. So on my other computer, the one that I already have that's functional, I'm going to go to the motherboard manufacturer product page for the motherboard that I've chosen and in this build we're using the B550 Aorus Pro. Go over to the support page and you should be treated to a download section. Bear in mind this is a gigabyte motherboard if you have an Asus or an MSI. It might look a little bit different than this but you should be able to access uh, the main functional things. We're going to expand the BIOS tab here to see which BIOS options are available and I can see there is an F1 BIOS since this is a really new motherboard. This is the one that it shipped with the first release and it does look like they have an update to version F2A. At this point I don't know which BIOS version my motherboard shipped with so I'm just going to download the latest version just to make sure I have it on hand. Now that's all we really need for the next step right now but just while I'm here on this other computer I'm going to go ahead and do a couple other things. One is to download the latest Windows 10 installer. Uh, they call it Installation Media, and there's a tool for that. So, so you can go to the Microsoft.com website, which I will link down in the video description if you want a direct link to it, and just click Download Tool Now. That will download the latest media creation tool. And then I'm gonna take my USB drive, and I'm gonna make sure I don't have anything on here that I wanna save, because it's gonna be completely erased, and I'll plug it into my other computer. And by this point, you may have noticed that I'm not actually using this laptop. I was just using it as a visual aid and doing everything on my other system over here. <laughs> With my USB drive plugged in, I go to my downloads folder and I'm going to launch the media creation tool that I just downloaded. And now as with many steps in this process, we will have a short wait. Read the license agreement thoroughly and hit accept. And now we have the option to upgrade the PC we're on or create installation media. We want to create the installation media and we'll use the default settings, Windows 10 and 64-bit. You can create an ISO file that you can burn a DVD with, but nobody does that anymore. Let's just use the USB flash drive. We'll hit next, and there's only one USB flash drive connected to this system that is viable, so 
uh, we'll select that and also hit next. Now it's gonna erase everything on that drive, reformat it and make it into a Windows 10 installation media device. I'm doing a few things a little out of order and that's just because I'm trying to do everything on the secondary computer that needs to be done before we move on to working with the new system. So now I'm gonna plug in my mass storage device and do a little bit of backing up of stuff on this system. So if you're upgrading from an old system, you wanna make sure that you have everything off of it that you might need to save. It helps to back up your My Documents folder. It helps to get a list of all the applications you have installed so you can reinstall them. And you may have your own filing system for where you save all of your important data, especially irreplaceable stuff like pictures. Just make sure all that stuff is back backed up, uh, ideally to multiple drives that aren't installed on the system that you're backing up. I'm gonna plug this in real quick. Just past 69% uh, on setting up the Windows 10 installer. And look, we have a nice clean empty drive to back up stuff with. Now you might have multiple drives connected to the system. So just reality check. I'm gonna be ba backing up to this new drive that I just plugged in. And I'm gonna focus on just backing up uh, Steam games that you might have downloaded because if you're on a metered internet connection or you just don't want to wait for some game that's 20 or 50 or 100 gigs, you can save some time this way. Now Steam will automatically install to your C drive under program files x86 and then you can find the Steam folder and then you should have a Steam apps folder and then in there you should have a folder called common. In the common folder, you will have any games that are installed to this system. So there I have Civilization VI installed, but I actually did another Steam library on this computer because I have an additional uh, SSD. So on that, I have a Steam library, Steam apps, and common. So basically what you're looking for with Steam is the Steam apps folder and then the common folder within that. And then you should have all these folders with games that you have installed. For me, that's about 114 gigs worth. So on my external drive, I'm just gonna create a folder called games and then Steam library. And then Steam apps. And then just grab whichever folder uh, of the game that you want to back up and drag and drop it and it should copy. I'm just gonna copy over Rocket League for now. And now I'm multitasking, backing up Rocket League to my external drive while I also create that Windows 10 media USB, which is currently 54% through actually creating the media. I will give it a few moments and then I will continue. All right, my USB flash drive is ready and hit finish. All right, so with my Steam games backed up onto my external drive and my USB drive created, we are ready to switch back to the new computer that was just built. I'm gonna do one last thing here. I'm gonna go into this Windows Media Creation Tool USB that I just made. I'm gonna make a new folder and title it Gigabyte B550 Aorus Pro. And then I'm gonna grab those downloads that I just did. Uh, one is the UEFI. There's a .bat file, a .exe, a .txt. All we really need here is this .f2a file, which is the UEFI itself, copying that. And then we also got that LAN driver, so I'm gonna copy that to this folder as well. Bingo. So I've ejected both drives from my existing functional computer. I've got them both here. I will save uh, my external storage drive for later, and I'm gonna plug my USB drive directly into one of the USB ports on the back of the I.O. on this computer. And now I'm actually gonna power it on. I've got a mouse and keyboard hooked up to this system, and right after I power it on, as it's booting up for the first time, uh, within the first five or 10 seconds, I'm gonna tap the delete button on the keyboard. That tells the system to go into the UEFI. Uh, you might've seen it for a brief second there so that I can make some changes. Also, if it's a new system, you might get a message that says the BIOS has been reset, for example. And now here is the UEFI, or BIOS. BIOS stands for Basic Input Output System, by the way for the B550 Aorus Pro. And up here on the top left, we can see we're currently on BIOS version F1. So the first thing I'm gonna do is update the BIOS. And for that, Gigabyte has a utility built in here called QFlash, which I can click on, or you just press F8. We're gonna do a BIOS update. You can also back it up with this tool. And I'm going to go to that folder. And since there's only one drive connected, that USB drive, that's the one it went to. And I can find, I can see the folder that I'd made for the B550 Aorus Pro. UEFI, and then there's the version F2A that I just downloaded, and hit next. Are you sure? Hit yes. Press the start, and bear in mind, as the UEFI is updating, it's it, you should not unplug or turn off the computer in any way. A power outage right now is generally a pretty bad thing. It's not as bad as it used to be because these mother, newer motherboards have functions where you can update the UEFI if it's corrupted uh, without having a CPU installed, so that will let you bypass if, it, if something does go wrong, but this should only take a few minutes and then you should have an updated BIOS. UEFI update is finished and now it's automatically rebooting. The system is rebooting automatically after the UEFI update. I am tapping the delete button yet again to get back in there so we can set the XMP settings. 
Okay, we can see we've updated. Uh, we're on BIOS version F2A now, so that is good. And now we're just setting XMP settings. For our memory, we can see right here under DRAM status, it says XMP disabled. I literally just clicked that once and it, ena it enables it. Most UEFI BIOS uh, interfaces, uh, Gigabytes, MSIs, ASUS has some functionality like this. They also often have an easy mode like what we're looking at right now that shows you some heads up info about CPU frequencies and temperatures and BIOS version. And they'll often have shortcuts to common tasks like enabling the XMP profile. That said, most motherboards will also have an advanced mode that usually has a menu going across the top. Uh, however, this usually does have that same function here, it's it's right here, XMP profile, and you can see it's already enabled it because we did it from the other setting. Now we're just gonna hit the F10 button. That should save, exit, and reset. We're gonna hit yes. We are now ready to install Windows 10. So we need to tell the system to boot off of that USB drive that I plugged in rather than attempting to boot off of the 2.5 inch SSD that I installed when I built the system in the previous video. Again, there are multiple ways to do this. From the UEFI, you can often go to boot settings and you can change the boot order to boot off of the USB drive rather than the SSD. But a lot of motherboards now also have a function as it's booting up called a shortcut boot menu, basically. So uh, usually it's accessed by hitting F10, F11, or F12. It varies from uh, motherboard to motherboard. But just like you hit delete to access this interface to get into the UEFI. I believe with this board it's F12 that you would hit to access this menu, but then you're offered uh, different options to boot from. So we can see the SSD that's installed, and there's two ways to boot off of the USB drive. You can just boot off of it directly, or you can boot off of it in UEFI mode. You want to do UEFI mode if you want to install Windows 10 in UEFI mode, which is what you want to do. So that's what I've chosen. And now it is booted off of that USB drive and we can uh, start installing Windows. Now here we choose the language and time and keyboard, and we can mostly leave those at default. You should change them if you're in a different region. Uh, you can also access repair functions here, so uh, don't throw away this USB drive once you're done installing Windows because it can be useful if you ever have any problems in the future. I'm gonna hit install. And right off the bat, Windows asks you for a product key. Um, you may have a product key. Uh, if you have an older version of like Windows 7 or Windows 8 and you have a product key from that, go ahead and plug it in, see if it works. But for now, most people can just hit, I don't have a product key, and you can still go through with the entire installation. You will need to choose which version of Windows 10 to install. So if you are planning on purchasing a product key in the future, or you already have one, make sure you choose the version that you're planning to activate with the key. Most likely that's gonna be either Windows 10 Home or Windows 10 Pro, and I usually go with Windows 10 Pro. More licensing agreements, which we will read thoroughly. And then here, if it's an existing system that already has Windows, you can upgrade. But I always do custom because I want to do a clean installation. That lets you start fresh. Now here, depending on what drives you have connected, they will be separated by partition. The drive number represents an individual drive. So the single drive that I have installed is currently partitioned into two partitions. So they're both labeled as drive zero. If you have other drives connected to the system, you might see drive one with more partitions on it, drive two, and so on. Windows 10 does a pretty good job of just installing to the drive that you tell it to. If you want to be super, super, super safe, uh, then you can unplug any drives uh, connected to your system that aren't the drives that you want to install Windows to. That said, if there are existing partitions on the drive, you should delete them. And bear in mind, this is going to delete all data on the drive. Uh, if you have a brand new drive, you should just see this, drive zero, unallocated space. Just select that and hit next. And now it's gonna do Windows 10 installation. And this part uh, should really go fairly quick, depending on the setup that you're installing from and how fast your USB drive is. In my experience though, it's uh, anywhere from eight to 15 minutes. So that was actually really quick. I, I feel like this gets faster every time, but it was between five and 10 minutes, probably closer to five. And now we're doing Windows 10 first time setup stuff like selecting the region, we're in the United States. US keyboard layout, of course, you should choose whatever applies to you if you are uh, installing this and you're not in the US or you have a different key keyboard layout that you're used to. As you're doing this, uh, keep in mind you have an ease of access button down here. So you can turn on a narrator that will read stuff to you and you can also do an on-screen keyboard that will let you type stuff in uh, if for some reason your keyboard's not working. Uh, just, just fairly useful uh, stuff to know. We're doing this for personal use. This is one of the things that asks you because we're using Windows 10 Pro. And then Microsoft is going to encourage you to sign in with a Microsoft account, which you can do. And in fact, if you have a Windows 10 license attached to your Microsoft account, you can sign in with it here, and then Windows will behave as if it's activated. I like to do offline accounts with my systems, just a personal preference for quite some time. Microsoft really pushes you towards not doing this, but yes, yes, I want the limited experience, Microsoft, please. Or even better, use an online account, no. Give your computer a fun name. I usually name it after the motherboard and that helps me figure out which 
computer I'm accessing if it's on the network or something, and then create a password. And I always recommend doing that here for the sake of this demonstration. I'm going to skip that so I don't have to keep punching it in. Now here's the privacy screen. And uh, if you're not familiar with Windows 10 or if you haven't kept up with it, Windows 10 does a lot of calling home and reporting of data. Here is where you can somewhat limit what data is sent back to Microsoft. So like speech recognition, find my device, inking and typing. Find my device, by the way, you might want to leave on if uh, you're dealing with a laptop, but uh, I usually turn that off. Add ID off, I just turn all of these off. And Microsoft is still gonna collect data on your, you via Windows 10 and send it back to Microsoft servers, but this will at least tell them, hey, I'd rather you not. This is just a way of telling them to track you less. Uh, no, I don't want activity history across devices. I do not want Cortana to help me out. I'm going for a simple, clean installation. Oh, oh, hi. And Microsoft still likes to say hi to you at this point. And after just a few more minutes of waiting, we are now, uh, we're in Windows 10. Windows 10 has installed and, and here it is. And it's popped up uh, Edge or Microsoft Edge to tell you welcome. And now we can start doing some setup stuff. But the first thing I'm gonna point out to you is that right down here in the bottom right, we have internet access. So uh, that's pretty cool. This version of Windows 10 was able to automatically recognize the network adapter that's built into this motherboard. And that means that we don't need to use this driver that we downloaded, so that's cool. At this point, we can move on to Windows 10 setup. And the first thing I do with Windows 10 setup is run Windows Update over and over and over again. If you press the Windows button and type update, update, uh, it should bring you to the Windows Update interface and you can hit check for updates and it should find updates and it should update your system and then it should, might prompt you for a restart or something like that. And basically you just wanna do this over and over again until it tells you that there are no more updates remaining. Part of the benefit of downloading the latest Windows 10 installer from the Microsoft site is that you should have fewer of these updates that you have to install. That said, there's always gonna be some and yes, you should always install the updates first. And whenever you're prompted to restart, you should restart. And after you restart, do Windows Update again. While I'm waiting for those updates to finish, uh, I have some UI tweaks that I pretty much always do with a new Windows install. And you can do these or not, it's just something that I always do, so I might as well show you. Uh, I go to Desktop Icons, which is in Themes and Related Settings. Desktop icon settings is here, and I like to have computer on the desktop, and that's purely a personal preference. You may or may not be interested in that, but I like to be able to right-click computer to go to manage or properties. The next thing I do is some changes to File Explorer, which you can open just by clicking File Explorer down there at the bottom. If you expand this ribbon across the top and go to View, you have a few options here as well, such as uh, click the Folder Options box here, and you can tell it to open File Explorer to this PC rather than Quick Access. And then you can go over to view, and I like to tell it to display the full path, to show hidden files, folders, and drives, to not hide empty drives, and to not hide extensions for known file types. This one of all the things is the thing that irritates me the most, and I always turn that off. Another thing we can do while Windows Update is running is go over to Google, and we will, uh, for the time being, we're gonna go to AMD B550 chipset driver. So I just go over to the AMD drivers and support page and uh, they have a tool that you can download to run and, and it will detect your hardware to install the right software. But I'm just gonna go ahead and go over here to chipsets and go to the socket AM4 chipsets and go to the B550 and hit submit. Here are the latest chipset drivers direct from AMD for that and I will hit download and uh, run or save, run or save, run once it's done. And now we will start our chipset installation. I would normally wait until the Windows updates are, are all finished for this, but uh, we do have a pending restart for that. Actually, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, yes, quit. This would probably be fine, but we're trying to be on the safe side here and recommend best practices. If you have a pending restart scheduled for something like a Windows update, especially if it's a cumulative update or something like that, do the restart first before you install other vital drivers like chipsets. And often with Windows updates restarts, you will have to wait a few minutes for that too. Checking Windows updates once again. All right, so this should hopefully mean we're done with Windows updates. You sure? Are you sure, Windows? Okay, we're good. Okay, back to the V550 drivers and support page, back to downloading this. For some reason, since I told Edge to run, I have no idea what it did with the file afterwards. I'm gonna hit save this time. Edge does save to the downloads folder, so I don't know where it put that temp file that it downloaded before, but it's okay. We are now installing the AMD chipset drivers, and as you'll see in just a moment, this actually does several things for our system. 
such as installing and activating the AMD Ryzen power plan, which is uh, the best and most optimized power plan available for the CPU at this point. It's better than the default one for Windows. And then you have a bunch of drivers, um, just making sure everything works properly. So we're gonna hit install. And hey, look, we get to restart yet again. Just a couple more things to do with Windows setup. One is gonna be the GPU driver and uh, Nvidia, if you've got an Nvidia card, has GPU drivers that are approved by Windows or Microsoft and those get the uh, WHQL certification and that means that if you run Windows Update over and over again you will automatically download a driver for your NVIDIA GPU. It's probably going to be an outdated driver though so right now we're in version 432. So even though I could just you know start gaming and everything right now this is an, ofi an official NVIDIA driver it's going to be best to go and download the latest NVIDIA driver from their website. I hate Bing and I hate that it just I don't want to percent I was saving software installations and updates for next, but I'm going to download Firefox right now because Edge managed to piss me off by doing that. So software updates are gonna be next, and uh, there's default software that ships with the computer, and then there's uh, other software that you probably wanna install. I'm installing Firefox right now. I have actually heard pretty positive things about the latest version of Microsoft Edge, their browser that they supposedly replaced Internet Explorer with. But I have not tried it yet because every time I use it, there's some initial thing that pisses me off and makes me not do it. So anyway, NVIDIA drivers. Let's search for that with Firefox. Oh, look at that. The top result was the download drivers page and it took me to the download drivers page. How useful. Thank you, Firefox. All right, pardon my sarcasm. We have a GeForce RTX 20 series card, the 2060 to be specific. So we're gonna choose all that. Windows 10 64 bit, hit search. Hit download, 451, hit download again. This always messes with me. I, with NVIDIA drivers, there's always this extra page that it jumps to before you click download. And I always forget that. And I'm like, wait, I thought I downloaded it. Anyway, it's downloading. It's a uh, five, 600 megabytes. And that's gonna take us from version 432 to 451 dot something. Downloading the latest drivers for your graphics card is really helpful, especially if you're playing brand new, brand new games, because those will often have driver packs specific to the game that launch uh, so it's, it's just best practice to get the latest drivers. Here we are, we're gonna run and install, and uh, so we're just gonna run that uh, package that downloaded, and that will kick off yet another installer. NVIDIA has a piece of software called the GeForce Experience that will run in the background. Uh, it's, it, it has its pros and its cons. I usually don't install it because I usually set up all my graphics settings by myself. That said, the GeForce Experience will like automatically download the latest drivers when they're available, and you can also use it to access uh, some of the recording features. So for now, I, I am going to install it, but uh, you might not want it, it's up to you. If you're updating a driver, uh, it can sometimes help to do a clean installation. Since this is a completely fresh install, that's not really necessary. And again, we'll just give this a few minutes to go through the installation process. And again, while that's installing in the background, I'm going to try to multitask by going over to Google. GPU drivers installing so the screen may flash a little bit. But the next thing I want to do is install some other uh, software, some other applications that I'm going to be using. You might have a wide range of software that you want to install, especially if you're upgrading from an old system where you listed the software you had installed. You might want to go and download the, those directly or updated versions. And oh look, the graphics driver finished installing, so that's good. Hit close. So the first piece of software I always install is a different browser, just because I'm really used to doing that. I recommend Firefox these days. Firefox is the, is the go-to. That said, I use Chrome pretty often as well. I usually roll with both of them installed. So here are the four pieces of software I'm gonna download right now. Uh, the first one is Hardware Info, Hardware Info 64, as it has been known. Uh, just doing the free download there, I will save. CPU-Z is next, and these are both what I call monitoring apps. I, I mean, they are monitoring apps. And I'm gonna be running these to double check and verify that uh, my system settings are, are proper, that everything is working the way I told it to work. Uh, I like the zip English version for CPU-Z. Steam summer sales going on right now. I will also be downloading the Steam installer right here. And finally, the latest version of OBS Studio, uh, which is gonna be pretty key if you want to record your gameplay or game and stream at the same time, which I will hopefully be doing a demo of in just a few minutes. So there are my downloads. I'm gonna go ahead and grab CPU-Z x64 version and bring it over here into a folder I made called monitoring, uh, hardware info as well. Oh, also only need the 64-bit version of that. 
For Hardware Info 64, I usually just run sensors only. You can also do a summary and actually it will give you more data than CPU-Z will give you, generally speaking. Uh, also, there's always updates for Hardware Info um, and I can never decide whether or not I want it to get the beta version. Anyway, that's fine. Let's start off with CPU-Z though because this is a pretty simple way to look at it. And we're just reality checking here. We've got a Ryzen 5 3600 that's installed. We can see the speed that it's running at. It's uh, bouncing back and forth between about 4.2 gigahertz and a base clock of uh, 3.5 or 3.6. We can take a look at the main board or motherboard tab here and we can see uh, the BIOS and the BIOS version that we have installed, for example, is F2A. Memory is something that we want to double check to make sure that the XMP values took properly. Uh, the DRAM frequency, double that should be the memory speed. So a DRAM frequency of 1600 megahertz, rounding up from 1596 or so here. 1600 megahertz times two is 3200, which is the rated speed of this memory kit that I have installed. The kit I'm recommending in the description for the build, by the way, is 3600 rated speed memory. The kit that I installed though is actually a two by four gig kit though. So I wanted to have uh, all 16 gigs available. And you know, you could dabble in memory overclocking if you wanted. I bet I could run this kit at 3600 if I really wanted to. <clears throat> you can look at graphics and stuff here as well, but uh, let's jump over to hardware info. Actually, let's also turn down the scaling. It's at 300% right now, because it's a 4K monitor. That's better in that it allows me to see more stuff on screen, but probably a little bit smaller for you guys. So I hope you can kind of see what's going on here. But uh, basically we can see the current minimum, maximum, and average values for a bunch of different sensors in the system. So we can see the current frequency that the CPU is running at, which is usually gonna be about 3.5 gigahertz, peaking at about 4.2. That's pretty standard for a 3600. We can see the memory clock speed that uh, we just looked at in CPU-Z. It's being reported here as well. And then we can see the CPU temperature here uh, and the main thing we're going to want to be looking at is the die temperature. Uh, there's a bunch of different sensors in the CPU though, so showing lots of different things such as the infinity fabric clock and other useful information. Now because we're using the Wraith Stealth cooler, which is adequate but not the best, our temperatures here are probably going to be a little bit higher. So seeing an idle temperature of around maybe 30 to 35 degrees Celsius is pretty good. Uh, although it's gonna vary depending on the ambient temperature in the room that you're in. Uh, with a lower profile cooler, you might see something a little bit warmer. So 41 or so isn't too terrible when it comes to the minimum here. And it's getting up to around 50 or so, uh, peaking at about 68. And while right now we're just taking a look at these values to make sure everything's fine and nothing's crazy overheating or anything like that, Having the software installed will allow you to run it while you're doing other things like playing a game or gaming and streaming. And that will allow you to keep an eye on things like, oh, the CPU is getting pretty warm because the cooler is kind of just getting things done rather than a good cooler. Maybe I want to upgrade my cooler. If your CPU gets too warm, it can even start to throttle things a little bit. Um, it's usually pretty good at automatically doing that so it won't overheat and cause any actual problems. But this is the reason why people do upgrades to their system over time is because they realize like, oh no, that cooler I have, the fan has to spin really fast in order to cool properly so it's loud and then I hear that so I want to swap that out for something that can cool more efficiently or that has fans that can run at lower RPMs so it won't generate as much noise and possibly at a lower temperature it might even be able to maintain higher frequencies over time. Now at this point the computer is pretty much set up and good to go and you could go about doing other stuff that you might want to do like installing specific programs. I'm going to do a quick proof of concept to play a game and also game and stream at the same time. To that end I have installed Steam and logged in via Steam Guard and then I've also gone ahead and installed installed OBS Studio and it went and did an automatic update for me. It wants to run the auto configuration wizard, which I think I'm gonna do just for the sake of simplicity. But before that, I wanna point out that I have added just a few more things to this setup. One is a headset uh, connected to this computer if you want to be able to hear the games you're playing. And if you wanna also jump on your team chat or discord or something like that, having a mic is pretty useful for that. I recommend a mic that has a hardware mute function built in. Like this one, if you uh, flip it up, then it mutes it. And that uh, gives you a little bit of peace of mind if you need to step away to do something else that you're not gonna be broadcasting what you say. Also for streaming, and this is optional, but uh, I dropped a webcam up here. Webcams are worth their weight in gold these days because they're in such high demand due to people doing telecommuting and stuff, but fortunately I have one around. So the cost of the webcam and the headset aren't included, but these are things that are somewhat necessary, although you can get by without them. Before I do that OBS setup for streaming though, I want to get Steam set up with my games that I've 
backed up from my other system. So I'm gonna plug this in. And there's my games folder from my external drive. And now if you have an external drive, especially if it's a faster drive like an SSD, you can just use it and uh, point Steam towards it as a Steam library rather than copying the game. I'm just gonna go through with my game copying uh, methodology here. And there are multiple ways to do this, by the way, you guys. This is just the way that I always use because it seems to be the most consistent. So the first thing that I do just to, so Steam will uh, set up that Steam library folder on my local drive here is I install just a small game that I know is gonna download quickly and I install that to the C drive. I usually use FTL for this because I think it's what, it's like 200 megs total, so it takes practically no time to install. And what that did is on my C drive in my program files x86 folder in the Steam folder, it now has a Steam apps folder as well as the common folder with FTL in there, and that's where you want to copy any games that you might be installing. So I'm going to go into my games, Steam Write Library, Steam apps folder over here, grab Rocket League, drag and drop it in there next to Faster Than Light, and wait for it to copy which hopefully doesn't take too terribly long. I guess while it does that, I can do more maintenance stuff, like removing some of these apps that are pinned to the taskbar, like Internet Explorer. You can go into default apps for like your web browser and switch it to Firefox. If you've downloaded that, that's a good thing to do. And I'll go ahead and pin Firefox to the taskbar down here as well. Might as well do the same with OBS Studio and Steam. Oh yeah, Steam. The Steam shortcut doesn't always work as the shortcut in the taskbar. It's, it's whatever, it's fine. All right, the copy finished. So now I'm gonna go back to my library over here and I'm gonna go down to Rocket League. It's offering me the ability to stream this because I have multiple Steam computers on my network, but uh, you can click the down arrow here and go to this machine and then install on this machine. And if I tell it to install in the place where I just copied that folder and I hit next and I agree, it should start by creating local game files, but in a second it should say discovering existing files. It will go through and discover the files, then it will check if it needs an update, and then it will update it, and then you should be able to play the game. And for a lot of games, especially games that are huge, 50 gigs, 100 gigs plus these days, uh, this could save you a lot of time. And again, especially if you're on a metered internet connection, uh, this could be a night and day difference of whether you can still watch movies on Netflix for the rest of the month. Let's get OBS set up and uh, I'm just going to use the auto configuration wizard just for the first time, optimizing. Um, uh, you can optimize for streaming or optimize for recording. This is up to you, whatever you're gonna be doing more. Uh, I'm gonna do for recording for right now since I'm not actually gonna stream today, I'm just gonna record. And from your computer's perspective, uh, some settings might change when it comes to encoding speeds and stuff like that. But if your computer is encoding a stream, it doesn't really matter to your computer whether it's writing it to a disk and saving it locally or sending it over the internet to Twitch or YouTube or something like that. It's functionally the same amount of work. So this is gonna take you through some basic settings like what resolution and frame rate you want to be at. Um, it's automatically chosen to use the NVENC encoder uh, built into the RTX 2060, so that's nice. That's what I would have done anyway. So I hit apply settings. I'm still gonna go back into settings here to check a few other things though. Uh, for instance, our hardware we wanna make sure is using the right audio device. So for audio out, we're just gonna use our speakers, which is essentially our headphone that's plugged in. And for the mic, since I plugged in the webcam, the webcam has a mic built in, but I don't wanna use that because it's not a very good mic. So we're gonna use the mic here Hit apply. And now we're gonna set up our scene with some sources. So we're gonna have a video capture device that's gonna be webcam. Let me move that into a better position. Looks okay. Once you have something on screen like this, a webcam, you can hit the Alt key to drag in the edges if you want to crop it. And then usually uh, your, your video of yourself, you'll kind of shrink down in the corner here somewhere. When I flip down my uh, mic, I can see my mic here on the audio and you have a little soundboard here, a mixer, where you can sort of adjust those. Your mic aux will be a mic if you have that plugged in so you can talk and record that. And then your desktop audio here will be what's uh, your game eventually once I load that up. And the webcam does have audio, but I'm just gonna mute that so it doesn't come through. I'm just gonna double check settings here um, from what it's set up with the wizard. If you go over to output, the default mode is simple and it will have your video bitrate and the encoder that's being used in the audio bitrate. If you switch from simple over to advanced, then you'll have some more functions there and uh, you can adjust the bitrate. You can do it otherwise as well. NVIDIA does have an OBS guide for using the NVENC encoder about bitrate resolution and uh, stuff like that. I'll link this in the description if you wanna read through it for some more of the details. But here, for example, we can get a good recommendation for if you're streaming at 1080, 60 FPS, what bitrate you should go for. And you wanna start off at uh, 6,000, depending on the upload speed that you're capable of, and then you can crank that 
that up a little bit for Mixer YouTube. Well, not Mixer anymore. They, sh they should update this guide because Mixer's not no longer a thing. But from 6,000 up to like 12,000 for YouTube. So taking a look at advanced mode, uh, note the encoder can change here. So X264 is encoding on the CPU. NVIDIA NV Inc. uses the hardware accelerated encoder that's part of our RTX 2060, so that's what we want to use. There's different rate control options, including CQP, which is a, a constant quality profile. Uh, and there's definitely something to be said for trying that out. But for now, I'm going to go with the mode that lots of people have been using for quite some time. I'm going to go with a higher bit rate. We'll, we'll bring it up to, let's say, 9001, just so it's over 9,000. I'm gonna set the keyframe interval to two. We want the preset on quality, the profile on high, and we want psycho visual tuning enabled. And do note that in advanced mode, you have a streaming uh, encoding box, and then you also have recording. And if you just wanna use the same option for streaming and recording, just tell it to use the stream encoder for that, and then your CPU won't be doing additional work. Also for recording, I like to save as MKV files just in case anything goes wrong that's easier to recover. And if you do do that, go over to Advanced and turn on Automatically Remuxed MP4. There are a lot of tweaks and stuff you can do with different settings for OBS. That's why it's nice. It actually gives you access to a lot of this stuff. But this is a tutorial about setting up a computer and not necessarily about streaming. So I'm just going to go with this for now. And I'm going to switch my capture over to capture to this folder I made on the desktop. All right, so Rocket League is ready to go and I've loaded Hardware Info 64 just so I can keep an eye on things and especially these maximum value tabs. Uh, and the thing I'm keeping probably the closest eye on here is going to be the CPU temperature. Let's go ahead and launch Rocket League. I've added another thing, by the way, which is an Xbox 360 controller because it's Rocket League and I have a better time with the controller. Okay, so Rocket League has finished updating. I am running Hardware Info 64 so we can keep an eye on things while we are running this test. And specifically, I'm gonna be keeping an eye on the CPU temperature, maximum uh, temp in particular, as well as the frequencies that we're running at. So now that the game is running, I can Alt-Tab, going over to OBS, and I'm gonna add one more source here for our scene, and that's going to be Game Capture. And you can tell it to capture any full screen application or a specific window. And in this case, I'm gonna tell it to capture the Rocket League window and hit OK. And hey, there it is. Keep in mind, depending on the resolution that you're playing at and various other factors, you might need to resize. You can right click, go down to transform and fit to screen, that helps. And if there's something that's 3D rendered, but you're on the desktop in 2D mode, it might not actually show up in OBS until you switch back over to the game, like this. So at this point, just to do a little test, I'm going to hit start recording and I'm going to jump into Rocket League. And I'm not going to really do anything, I'm just going to go around the menu a little bit. Oh, also the game capture window should be below the webcam so you can still see the webcam. Hi! Stop recording. Capture folder here. Alright, it looks good, it sounds good, so I think we are good to play a game. Oh, here's what else I'm going to do. I'm going to hit start recording. I'm going to reset my settings on Hardware Info 64. And then I'm going to jump into the game, quick play. It's kind of weird because I'm capturing, recording OBS over here, and I'm also capturing and recording OBS over here. It's interesting. I haven't played on this map before. Touch the ball, that means I'm doing well. Oh, there we go. There we go. There we go. Get in there! See, I was I was there. I, w I helped. I provided moral support. Good job, Gerwin. I was an AI player. <laughs> I don't get a block for that. That looked like a pretty clutch block to me. Yes! Yes! Clutch goal with only 13 seconds remaining. We were already up 4-1, but I think I think that was really the uh, turning point in the game. Oh, the crowd's really into this one. We won. Oh, I got an achievement. All right, so now we're going to check out how the system's doing. Uh, I'm going to hit stop recording over here, and we can see that our average temperature was about 73.8. We peaked at 81.8, which is warm, but not terrible. Uh, we stayed within range of reasonable expectations for uh, what the CPU should be running at, and we were hitting about 4.2 gigahertz. I can't say that that was the whole time. We'd have to do some other logging for this or set up another monitor so it could be viewed real time. And just double checking my recorded footage, which you guys already probably saw a decent amount of, uh, and, and it actually turned out pretty nice there. 
There are obviously some tweaks that could be made to optimize things. And like I said, streaming or using something like OBS to capture gameplay and record it, uh, there's a lot of details to a lot of different settings that you could go in and mess around with, but that's not really the focus of this tutorial. The focus is getting your system from having just been built to put together, to loading windows, to getting games loaded up, to actually gaming, and possibly even gaming and streaming at the same time. Now all you need is like a bubbly personality and to be able to say witty things off the top of your head and get people to watch your content. I can't help you out with that, but hopefully this video has helped you get your new system up and running for the first time to play some games, to stream, to capture, to do the things that people like to do with gaming PCs once they're put together. That is all for this video though, you guys. Thank you so much for watching, sticking with me through the whole thing. Relevant links are down in the video's description, as well as a link to my store at paulshardware.net where you can buy shirts, mugs, pint glasses, and other super sweet merchandise. Hit the thumbs up button on your way out if you enjoyed this video, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you'd like to see more useful tutorials like this one in the future. Thanks again, guys. We'll see you next time.